So last week we began the story of Abram, who God called to leave his land, to leave his comfort, to leave his support system, to leave all the things that were predictable, and to just go. And God said, I'll tell you when to stop. And when Abram got to where God said to stop, it wasn't very pretty. But Abram knew that God had led him there. Abram knew that God had spoken. And he built an altar. An altar is a symbol of when someone had an encounter with God. When God spoke and when something changed. And remember, I said last week that if you want to receive the promises of God, you have to be willing for something to change. Abram was willing for something to change. God brought him to a place and Abram built an altar of stone as a reminder to himself and as a symbol to anybody else who came across that altar that God was at work, that God did something. And we ended last week with you guys taking stones and writing on those a moment in your life when God met you. Maybe it was the moment, the, the time that you accepted Jesus into your heart. Or maybe it was a time in your life where God just made himself very real to you and you committed your life in a different way or, or he, he led you to make a decision or whatever it may be. And we began an altar over here that I can tell you guys through the week, there have been people who have come over and they're looking at this and you know what it's doing? It's telling them God's at work here. God is moving. It's doing right here in Upland, in this building, it's doing exactly what it did when Abram built his altar. And tonight we're going to break up into detour groups for a bit. And we're actually going to combine some detour groups. And so we'll, we'll do that in a minute. But um, what we would like to do tonight is hear from you. See, when we just go through our, our, our own faith journey and never talk about it, it can be easy to lose heart or wonder whether it's real or wonder if God is doing anything in anybody else's life. And so God calls us to testify, to speak of our love for him, to speak of our commitment to him. Baptism is an external demonstration of our faith. And so tonight, when we break up into detour groups, we are going to ask you, for anybody who's willing, we're not going to force anybody, but we would love to hear your story. What did you write on that rock last week? Maybe it was a date. Why was that date important to you? Maybe it was an event. What went on where you felt like God led you? And what, what, what is that about? And we're going to take some time. And like I said, nobody's going to be forced. Nobody's going to be put on the spot. But one of the hopes with these groups is that it's a safe place for you. That you can know that the people there are going to support you and love you and you can trust them. And that this would be a time where we can share what God is doing in our life. In this case, what God did at whatever point where he led you, where you felt like, man, God stirred something up. God directed me in a certain way. I met God. So that's what we're going to do right now. We're going to come back at 8.30. And so we've got about 25 minutes to um, just share with one another. And um, hopefully this will encourage your heart in a way of going, wow, God really does do stuff in people's lives. It's not just my life. Or Maybe you're in a place where you're like, I haven't felt like God's done anything in my life. And you can hear these stories and be like, wow, okay, well, I guess God does do, God does move in people's lives. And so right now, um, if leaders, if you could stand up and then uh, let's begin by go ahead and go find your detour group leader. And then we will combine some groups as well. <laughs> Abram. Abram. Sarai and Lot were hungry. Not the, oh, I'm home from school, got out of school at three, had a snack, and now it's 
kind of hungry. This was that hunger where you're not, you're not even hungry anymore. Now you're just sort of nauseous because you haven't eaten in so long that the acids in your stomach have begun to feed on your stomach lining. The point, the point where you just sort of start to get dizzy, you've got that headache, and honestly, you can't think clearly, and you're wondering whether you're ever going to actually get to eat ever, ever again. And this was the place that Abram and Sarai were at because in the area of the Negev, there was a famine. See, God had told Abram to leave his home, remember, where things were good, things were comfortable. He had everything that he needed, and God said, leave, and I'll show you where, where you need to go. And so he went, and he followed, and when God said stop, he stopped. And his thought was, hey, okay, we're good to go. And then a famine hits. Famine means no food, no provision, no way to grow food, herds and flocks are suffering and dying because there's no grass. It's a bad situation. And Abram decides that he's going to take Sarai and Lot and they're going to go to Egypt because Egypt being a hub, well, there's probably going to be food there. And so they head off to Egypt. And when they're on their journey to Egypt, Abram has a crisis of faith. That's right. Abram, this guy who has heard from God, this guy who trusted God enough to leave everything he knew and go to this foreign land, all of a sudden, he starts to wonder what God's really up to. And is God really going to be in control here? He gets really afraid as they enter into Egypt. And he realizes that if any of the Egyptians took a liking to his wife that they wouldn't hesitate killing him off so they could take her as their own. And so he decides that here's what we're going to have to do. And he goes to Sarai and he says, tell them you're my sister because then they won't be threatened by me and they'll let me live. Abram, the guy who had heard from God, who had trusted in God, now took things into his own hands, decided this is the plan, this is what I've got to do so that I can survive. And they head off into Egypt. Sure enough, people notice Sarai. She's a pretty lady. In fact, she's so pretty that word gets back to Pharaoh, the head of Egypt. I said, man, this chick who just hit town, whoo, man, you got to check her out. And Pharaoh calls for Sarai. When Pharaoh calls you, you don't object. You don't fight it. You, don't, you just go. And Pharaoh took her into his house to be his wife. And just like Abram had told her, she told Pharaoh, yeah, that's my brother. And Pharaoh goes, oh, cool. Well, he wanted to get on Sarai's good side. So he gives Abram all this stuff all this gold and silver and supplies. I mean, just loads Abram up. And then everybody gets sick in Pharaoh's house. Not the, oh, I don't feel so good. We're talking plague sick. And Pharaoh calls for Abram and goes, what's going on here? Ever since your sister arrived, everybody's gotten sick. What's going on? And Abram goes, yeah, well, uh, she's my wife. Now, Pharaoh could have killed him right then, not only to get rid of him, but because he did this to them. But Pharaoh goes, get out. Take your wife and get out. And he actually gives Abram even more stuff. He bribes him to leave. Here, Take whatever you want. Get out of here and get out of Egypt. You're cursing us because you have let this happen. So here is this mighty man of faith who heard from God, who knows how to listen to God. He comes up with this plan to try and keep himself safe and everything goes wrong. 
And then God steps back in and redeems the situation and they leave Egypt. Well, having left Egypt, they got to be, they had all this stuff. Lot had all this stuff. Abram had all this stuff. And a bunch of time passed. And these flocks that they had became huge. The people, they had people working for them. They had all these employees handling the sheep and this guy handled the goats and this guy handled all the housing and this guy handled, and they had all this stuff. So much that the things began to blend together. Lot's stuff and Abram's stuff began commingling and getting mixed up. And when you're in charge of something, you want to make sure that you can handle it. And so all of the handlers on Abram's side began fighting all of the handlers on Lot's side and things became, became a mess. All these reports came back to Lot and came back to Abram saying, things are a mess. You got guys fighting out here. I mean, they're punching each other in the head over a sheep. <laughs> you got to do something. And so there were some meetings. There were some strategy sessions. Put up some fences. Tried to, tried to organize some things. None of it worked. And everything was a disaster. So Abram, desiring to trust God, that God knew what was best, did something unthinkable. He said to Lot, the much younger person, choose where you want to go. You go over there, I'll go over here. You go to the right, I'll go to the left. That's ridiculous. Abram had the right to choose. Abram, if he were looking out for himself, he would have said, hey, I'm going to be over here. You go find somewhere else. But he didn't. He allowed Lot to choose. And so Lot chose this area down in the valley where there's tons of water, green everywhere. His flocks were going to flourish. He was going to be able to grow anything he wanted in this area. It was down toward the area of Gomorrah. And he went down and he said, all right, I'll take this area. And Abram said, fine. You're going to go down there. I'll head up toward Hebron. Everything that Lot's land was, Hebron was not. Hebron consisted of sand, dirt, cliffs, and rock. It was terrible. It was awful land. No one would choose to go there, but that is where he felt God was leading him to. Lot chose there, so Abram goes up to Hebron. And when Abram arrives in Hebron, God speaks. And he says, all of this land that you have set foot on and that you can see will be yours. In this area, your descendants will flourish. And he built an altar. Abram builds another altar, but this altar's different. The first altar that Abram built was because God actively had done something. God led him to that place. And so he's like, I'm building an altar so everybody knows God did this. Well, this altar, God hadn't done anything. Everything that this altar represented was in the future. Did he have any of this land yet? Not yet. Did he have any descendants or even any hope for descendants? Sarai is still barren. She's still unable to have children. So Abram builds this altar on a promise of God. Abram builds this altar as an altar of waiting. Going, all right, I'm going to trust that you're in this. I don't see it yet. I don't know how this is all going to turn out. I don't know how I'm going to have descendants when my wife can't have a kid. But I'm going to build this altar as a reminder that you're here and that I need to wait on you. That I need to wait and see 
what you're going to do. And I'm going to trust in that. Have you ever had to wait on God? Where you pray something and what you prayed for doesn't happen. In fact, sometimes the opposite of it happens. Lord, help my parents to get along. And instead they get divorced. Lord, help this friend and I to be able to to get along and instead they start gossiping about you. Lord, help me to do well in school. And you continue to struggle and be confused and not do well on tests. Have you ever had to wait on God? We hate waiting. We are not good waiters. That's why we invented microwave popcorn. (laughs) We don't wait very well. We want things and we want them now and we want things to look the way we want them to look. Abram, all he had was the word of God. All he had was the promise of God. And so he built this altar as a reminder, wait on God. God has promised something, wait on him for him to make it come to pass. But we don't like to wait. But here's the position that Abram was in. That in my life, I'm often not in this place, honestly. Abram was desperate for God. You guys, Abram was desperate. There was nothing he could do about the land he was in. He couldn't make the rock grow stuff. He couldn't make this a beautiful, wonderful place. He couldn't fix his wife's reproductive system. He couldn't make her be able to have a baby. He was absolutely desperate for God. So I'll throw out that question again. Have you ever waited on God? But in that waiting, were you desperate for God to move? Or were you desperate for things to turn out the way you wanted them to? And I'll confess to you, I have all kinds of ideas of the way I want things. And often, that's what I'm desperate for. Abram was waiting on God. He was absolutely desperate for God. He was believing in the power and the promises of God. Do you believe in the power and the promises of God? Maybe until we're done waiting. Like, well, yeah, I believe God's power. We'll, we'll, we'll sing songs. You know, God, you are mighty. God, you are good. You're a good, good father. You're blah, 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 all these things. Unless you take too long, then you're not as good. Unless what I wanted to happen doesn't happen, mm, then I'm... Are you standing and believing in the power and the promises of God? And I want to stop right here for a sec and caution us that God's promises aren't always what we are standing on. Sometimes we're standing on what we want. And we call it, well, well, God said that he'd give me everything I want. And we stand on that promise. If that's the promise you're standing on, you're going to be waiting a long time. Because is that what God promised you? It's not. But God did promise that he would provide for you. God did promise that he would take care of your needs. Well, God said that he would would answer yes to anything I ask him. And we get mad when he doesn't answer yes. Did God promise to answer yes to anything you ask him? No. But he did promise to hear your cry. And he did promise never to leave you. Are you standing on the power and the promises of God? Or are you standing and and trying real hard to make what you want to happen, happen? Are you desperate for God, for him to move? Or is he just kind of a fallback option? Where are you at tonight? What is the thing in your life that you need to just, Stand on the promise 
of God. That God will be who he said he would be. That God has a plan and a purpose for your life. What is the situation in your life where you would go, I have to be desperate for God. Only God can do this. And it may not look the way I want it to look, but this is an area of my life when I need God to come through. Tonight, we're going to have the opportunity to continue to build our altar. And here's the question that I want you to consider on um, what you're going to write. What are you waiting on God and depending on him to do? What is it in your life that you're, you're in a place of waiting and you want the will of God or you, you want some sort of resolution? Maybe you've, you've been trusting in yourself. Maybe you've come up with your Egypt plan where it's like, okay, well, I'm gonna try this because it makes sense and I, it can make me feel good. But what is the thing in your life that you're waiting on God? And if you're honest, you realize you can't make it happen. What are you waiting on God for? Or what is the thing that you need to start waiting on God for? That you need to confess your desperation to him and build your altar of waiting. This is probably one of the hardest altars to build because we don't feel it necessarily right now. You don't see the outcome. It's not just down the road and so you've got some hope. Maybe this thing you've been stuck here for a while or maybe this thing you feel like is so bad, there's no hope in sight. Where are you at? What is that thing? And so in just a second, you're gonna have an opportunity to go to the back and the, the stones are on the back table and there are pens back there. Please only use one stone. The pens are back there and right on your stone what is the thing in your life that you're waiting on God for? What is that desperation that you've got going right now that you can't fix, that you can't make happen? So God, right now, I pray that you would speak to us. We don't want this just to be craft time. We don't want this just to be a religious exercise. We want this to be about you moving in our hearts. And God, we confess that we don't want to wait. We confess that it's hard when you're silent. But God, give us the faith that Abram had to trust in your promises, to trust in who you are, and to wait on you. And whatever these situations are, whatever these, these things in our life are that seem so big, I pray that you would bring your power and that we would have a deeper understanding of how you are so able to move in each of these situations. So God, we will wait for you. Show us how desperate we are and how in need we are of you. At whatever point you're ready, you can go ahead and head back to the back and take a stone and write on it and like I said just a minute ago don't let this just be craft time pray about what God would have you write on that stone be real be vulnerable and go ahead and place it over on the altar by the cross mm -hmm.